Welcome to the Nuggets Inc. podcast, presented by no one. I'm your host, Matt Schubert, joined once again by our beat writer, Bennett Durando, to talk about all things Nuggets, including Jamal Murray, back in Toronto, Peyton Watson, blossoming before our very eyes, that loss to OKC, and who's been naughty and who's been nice. All that and more, coming up next. We're using all the, the just fantastic boomer technology uh, to bring you Nuggets Inc. Uh, before the holidays and before the the Nuggets play their big Christmas Day game against the uh, Draymond Green Less Warriors. Uh, Bennett coming to us live from uh, where are you at in New York exactly? Uh, so I'm actually in the financial district because it's the perfect middle ground where I have an easy subway uh, to the arena in Brooklyn and an easy subway to Penn station, which gets me back to the Newark airport. Uh, oh, and you for came in through Newark. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a good place to come in through. If you're going to New York, uh, that personal train, opinion, that travel train tips. Is so easy. Yeah. Oh that yeah. Train it's is a, easy into Newark or into I, I, Penn station. <laughs> what, what, one like aside here, uh, I stayed one time um, in uh, what it was like, in an Iberian Peninsula themed neighborhood, like a Portuguese neighborhood on the New Jersey side and a couple of Airbnbs that were cheap over there, but next to that, the station that you're talking about uh, that, that you can take right into downtown to Penn station. Highly recommend. Really? Yes. And, it's fantastic. And I, an Iberian area in New Jersey. Yeah. In Jersey. It's yeah. They have a bunch of like, uh, Portugal, Portuguese themed restaurants and uh, oh yeah, loved Man. it. I, I it's, wonder it's if kind of by a where the song about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like kind of by where the MLS stadium is. If you know where that is, okay, I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah, I've uh, I've been to New Jersey more than I would like to admit. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you 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 were in Toronto uh, last night uh, for. Uh, Jamal Murray's homecoming, kind of. Right? Kirchner is kind of by there, right? Isn't it pretty close yeah. by? Yeah, yeah, it, close enough. And they, so they uh, they put him up on the video board and, and they showed a picture of young Jamal and did a little standing ovation for him um, in the first or second quarter. So they uh, they treat him as, as a Toronto kid, even if it's technically Kitchener. But um but I, I also think they would maybe do that for any Canadian basketball player. Who right, yeah, Steve Nash. Six. Steve Nash, I think, used to get a lot of love going through Toronto. Yeah, yeah, you can sort of count on one or maybe two hands the uh, number of prominent Canadian players in the NBA, even though the national team is uh, on the rise. So, uh, oh, there's, I mean, you got SGA. That's, he's a legitimate star. Okay, you've, so got you've got SGA, Andrew, Andrew Wiggins, Wiggins, Jamal Murray, Dylan Brooks, where, and then I think there's a drop off. Andrew Wiggins, group. you're not you're not including Andrew Wiggins in that group. No, no, yeah, Andrew Wiggins is in there. Okay, all right, yeah. I mean, that's that's a pretty solid four right there. That's a good four. Um, and and then you throw in um, that, that is on one hand, however. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's true uh but kelly olenic you throw him in you, now you got five now we're cruising now we're still <laughs> on one hand <laughs> <laughs> i feel like i'm forgetting some people I, I can't i don't know who but i i know we're forgetting some people um, uh, sga murray and wiggins are definitely the big three though who you you think sga is the top canadian at this point yes yes um, but but Murray's sort of like right there with them. I, I, I realize that like SGA has the better regular season bona fides at this point. He's been an all NBA guy, but SGA has not really done it in the playoffs, obviously like Jamal. I'm, I'm not going to hold that against Shea at this age though. Uh, no. He, uh, I, he like legitimately has an MVP ceiling. I got a mailbag question about this a month or two ago, in fact, and it's just it's hard to make the case for Murray over Shea if if you're talking about the ceiling for their careers and and the current resume even like a first team All NBA sort of you know overtakes whatever Jamal has and and if you want to say well Jamal Murray is the second best player on a championship team 
Andrew Wiggins was the second best player on a championship team as well. So, oh, he's he's you got to take him over Wiggins. I that I I would take Murray over Wiggins. No, I I was just using that as the counter argument. To sure, that being the case for Murray over Shea, but right. yeah, Wiggins has been an All Star as well. Yeah, that's true. I I kind of feel like Jamal has been hamstrung by having to compete for All Star berths with. Let's just, it's a more stacked position. Um, you know, Certainly. there's just yeah. more really good guards. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I would take Jamal too. I'm just playing devil's advocate, but uh, I also thought of a couple others. There's uh, RJ Barrett's Canadian, I believe. Oh, um, yeah. 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 That's, so that's six all, man. That's all. And then Lou Dort, the Thunder. Or, uh, a team oh, of good Canadian. old Lou. Yeah, that's, mm-hmm. that's a solid seven right there. That They can do some damage in uh, some good world rotation. Team. Yeah. Yeah, just you stick with those seven. I think you're fine. Uh, yeah. You just need maybe another big man. Maybe Jamal McGlure can come out of retirement and lumber up and down the court. Uh, that that might have been before your time, Jamal McGlure. He was uh, he was very much uh, a lumbering big man uh, with limited uh, skill. Okay. Yeah. I'll trust you. Uh, I, <laughs> for what it's worth. Linux might be a little bit of a disadvantage next to American national team center, Joel Embiid, but you know, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's a good. Seeing, call. As that's what, seeing as that's where Embiid is committed now for next summer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is something. So uh, how, how was the reception for Jamal? Is that, was there like a small Jamal cheering section for the game or was it just, once, once you do the ovation with the with the tribute, uh, back to uh, cheering for the raps. Uh, I mean, I think they have a pretty passionate fan base, and so they aren't going to be too distracted by Jamal being Canadian um, for too long. I, you know, I think they appreciate him wanting to put on a show there uh, from the jump in Toronto. He was uh, being especially aggressive, I think, in trying to take shots whenever he had an open look. Um, uh, it was not his most efficient night, but he was trying to, to sort of give them that show, I think. But, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's it's a the Raptors fan base, they uh, they care about their team. I've You know, when I've been in Toronto now for multiple Nuggets-Raptors games as well as an Avs-Leafs game, and I think the Raptors – uh, have a better home environment than the Leafs. So really, yeah, wow, and That's... and and it adds up because I, you know, what I've heard secondhand is basically that the Maple Leafs are sort of the they're the bourgeoisie uh, team for Toronto in terms of actual attendance, and the tickets are just so out of control to see them that uh, you know the common people aren't aren't at the arena as much. It's all the, you know, it's all the suites uh, are getting filled, but, but you know, it's, it's that hmm. sort of vibe, I guess. Interesting. Interesting. They're, they're also, that's a tortured fan base, the Maple Leafs fan base. It is truly, truly. <laughs> Who would have thought the Raptors have had more flashes of success in this, <laughs> in this century, really? Yeah. Right. Yeah. They've won. Well, they've won obviously a championship. They've been to the Eastern conference finals multiple times. They, They've had really good teams. They've had legitimate stars. Uh, I mean, I guess Austin Matthews. You know, he's he's a legitimate star for the Maple Leafs. But God, they're they're just cursed as a playoff franchise. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, obviously, uh, the Nuggets win that one. Um, and you know, one, one of the sort of I think emerging themes here in the last few weeks, and eh, maybe even longer, Peyton Watson really turning into a player. It's it's kind of incredible what's going on right now i mean like i i still think that he is going to have some dips um it just seems inevitable like he's too young he's too green but the run of games that he's on right now where suddenly like it's just the norm for him to be uh one of their matchups against against opposing team's best scorers pretty much like he is in that Casey with, Aaron Gordon little troop at this point of like we're just going to put you on on 
the guy who we need to stop the most. We trust you to do that. And, it, and he is in his first actual season in the NBA, which and, is crazy. And on top of that, like offensive efficiency. Yes. He, what is becoming very clear on top of the defense, I think in the last two weeks or so, um, is an increased confidence with the ball in his hands. Um, I think for a little while we were seeing some trepidation whenever the ball passed through him. He didn't want to hold it too long. He wanted to move it on to the next guy. Uh, There was maybe a fear of doing the wrong thing. And I think he has shed that fear in recent games and, and has sort of taken on a willingness to utilize his length, try and make moves get toward the rim, especially in transition. He's not afraid to pass it off anymore. Um, He's not afraid to pull the trigger on a three. He's made a three in four consecutive games now, which is pretty astounding. Um, That's a, that's a great development for him too. Uh, You know, if if he's he's going to be the three and D guy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like the, and and you don't even think of the three as being sort of the element of his game that should be, like the dominant part of his offense either just with sort of the, you know, the length and the skill that he potentially has. So uh, he shot five for six in Toronto, 11 points. Um, He was on the glass. I think he had four rebounds. He assisted a Jokic three. Um, He's doing pretty much all the right things, you know, like when his minutes overlapped with Siakam, he guarded Siakam. Um, add that to the list of, of guys that he's had to guard early this season. Um, and yeah, I mean, like he, he looks like one of the better bench players in the Western conference in an extremely small slice of games, a very small sample size. Like we can't say that outright. I don't think by any means, but, um, but if he is actually this good and can sort of maintain the way that he's played over the last few games, then, you know, you put him next to Christian Brown and Reggie Jackson, and this suddenly looks like a bench unit that is way more complete than anyone could have realized before the season, especially after losing Bruce Brown and Jeff Green. I think you could almost, at this point, I think you can picture Peyton Watson surpassing Christian Brown and being basically their second best player off the bench, if not their best player off the bench. Like that to me seems like something that is now very much in play, even for like the end of the season. Yeah. uh, I'm, I'm curious because I think Christian Brown has quietly played very well also. Um, Right. uh, You know, like uh, he, but but like, wouldn't you say, Sorry, mm-hmm. sorry to interrupt, but wouldn't you say that uh, Watson defensively is is already superior? I think so. Yeah, and and I mean, like part of that is just the tools that he has and the athleticism and the length. Uh, right. Christian Brown has a lot of that mobility and athleticism, but just has a different kind of build. Um, and so the guys that he can guard, he's just a little bit more limited in that respect. Whereas we're seeing. Peyton Watson, you know, take on smaller guards, take on wings, um, guys with the length of Kevin Durant, obviously. So, you know, that like that's a different level of versatility there that sort of just goes hand in hand with like the body type um, for Peyton Watson and the wingspan and everything. Um, I think Christian Brown's still a good defender. I, I hesitate to say that by the end of the season – we're just fully convinced that Peyton Watson in that exact moment is already better than Christian Brown, because I I do think that the experience that Christian Brown is going to sort of help him a little bit more uh, develop into a consistency that it might take Watson this year and change to develop. Um, I think, you know, assuming that Watson is that seventh or eighth guy, um, in in a playoff lineup, uh, the the postseason will be huge for him in that regard. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, I I think we agree and we have agreed for a while that the ceiling is very much higher for Watson. Um, it's just a matter of you know how rapidly we're going to see uh, that development and whether it develops into a consistency. 
Well, on top of uh, the on-court accomplishments for Peyton Watson, soon to be appearing in a commercial with yeah. none other than Nikola Jokic on Christmas Day. So he's he's excelling both on the court and off the court. That's it. Is uh, uh, they have a good relationship, Peyton and, and Nikola, and uh, you know they share an agency. That's sort of how the the whole thing came together. Um, but it's. I, I'm trying to think of examples even of just their interactions or anything like that. Um, but they, they have a, they have a very tight knit relationship considering the fact that Watson is a second year player who spent most of last season in the G league. And Nicole Jokic is a star player who isn't always like known as the most immediate leader to reach out to young guys and and sort of be that you know the the role model figure i guess well that that's like a mean way to put it toward Jokic, but but like when when we think about this off season like jamal murray was the one who was in town a little bit more and sort of working with um the rookies and and sort of being present in that sense for them um whereas that's not entirely Jokic's style we at media day before the season, um, I think Hunter Tyson and, and Julian Strother walked in and Julian said, I just met Jokic just now in the hallway. And Hunter Tyson said, I haven't met him yet. Um, <laughs> so, so like, you know, and, and Jokic had just flown back in from Serbia, like in the, you know, previous 48 hours. So uh, it's just interesting to see sort of the way that the uh, relationship has budded between Jokic and Watson. I think that's really good for Peyton Watson. Um, you know, I've there have been other guys on this team who have developed under uh, sort of the Jokic system and have really benefited from sort of, I, I guess, the leadership by example from him. Michael Porter Jr. is definitely one of those guys, and, and I think that uh, that Peyton Watson is going to benefit from that as well. And it seems like they just have a pretty strong friendship that you don't necessarily expect from, you know, that age gap and, and that uh, the, the brevity of the relationship so far, I guess. So uh, one other thing that happened uh, since last we talked was uh, that OKC game. Yeah. Um, Speaking of and, Shay. Yeah. And that, I mean, does that, did that game change your opinion of what, OKC is uh, in relation to the Nuggets. Essentially, like, are they? Do you now think of them as more of a threat after seeing that game uh, than maybe you thought a week ago? Yeah, it, it's a good question. I I don't know if I see them as more of a threat in a seven game series setting. Like, I, I still find it hard to envision OKC doing that um, in Denver probably multiple times because Denver's probably winning one out of three games in OKC. Um, although, you, you know, who am I to assume that Denver's the home team in a series, I guess, because the Thunder are ahead in the standings. But, um, I like, I don't know if, if they were to play a seven game series tomorrow would you still pick like would, would that change the fact that you're probably going to take the nuggets in five in that series <laughs> I, I, I don't think i, think I might I, to be honest i think it might be nuggets in six that would be okay. my prediction okay um, wow i i just i feel like they're one they're sort of like the the young um up and coming team, lots of talent, lots of depth. Um, and I think we can say that Yoke, this isn't the sort of series that Yoke can, can just dominate. Now, granted, he has the muscle. He can push around our, our young fellow whose name I'm, why can't I think of his name right now? Um, Chet Holmgren? Yeah, Chet. Chet. Wow, but, that's but like disrespect to Chet. But he, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chet, Chet. I apologize. Chet's very online. If he hears about a Denver podcast uh, <laughs> person forgetting his name live, then then uh, then he might keep those receipts. 
Hey, you know, maybe don't miss a full season, Chet. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, my, my point being like the shot blocking, the, the rim deterrent uh, of Chet Holmgren, I think makes things maybe a little difficult on Nicola. Not that I, I think he would figure him out and, and mm-hmm. he'd be able to use his just overall size against Chet and, you know, unless uh, Chet uh, gets a little fatter between now and the playoffs. Um, but I, I think that just their whole body, it seems like there's no obvious advantages for the Nuggets. I agree. Outside of the fact that, that Jokic is just, you know, an unbelievable, you know, best player in the world. Uh, so I think the chat factor and the rim protection that he brings is absolutely sort of the X factor that changes the goalpost here um, on what we would expect for like a playoff series between these two teams. Um, the nine blocks, uh, it was just like outrageous what he did. Um, Unbelievable. And, and, and that's, that's what gives you the most pause. It's what gives you the most alarm. The Nuggets were below 50% in the paint in that game, which is pretty shocking for them. Yeah. They Um, dominate the paint usually. Yes. Yes. However, I'm like the thing that makes me hesitate uh, to say, OKC is like all the way to that nuggets level right now is the fact that KCP was not playing in that game. Um, And you have an Oklahoma city offense that relies on a bunch of guys who can drive the ball really well and play one-on-one really well. Um, and KCP is Nuggets' best one-on-one defender. That's just sort of what it is, and and right. especially with those guards, like we saw what Caldwell Pope did against Shea that first game in OKC. Um, the way that the Thunder sort of made their money down the stretch and put together that fifteen to six run was a lot of blow buys. That was sort of how they generated most of their offense throughout the game, and I just don't think that they. Uh, have maybe enough variance in their offense yet at this point uh, with a healthy Nuggets lineup with Caldwell Pope playing to um, to solve that and sort of keep up with the Nuggets' firepower. I, I do think the Chet factor is real, though, and and that sort of is the thing that I'm circling as, okay, maybe this you know creates a problem. I, I also agree with you, though, that Jokic probably figures him out over the course of a series – um, as he does with most big men matchups that he's had to face um, in those situations. We saw him do it all post all, all throughout the playoffs last year. So, um, and we saw that first game in OKC too. Jokic just completely bullied Chet. So clearly like those games can go one of two ways where Chet is just eating up everything that gets to the rim or Jokic is having his way with him. Uh, and, I I don't know. I, I sort of lean toward the latter as sort of the what would prevail over the course of like a repeat matchup over the course of a week. He, you've seen him in person twice now. What is your impression of Chet? Is this guy like a superstar in the making? Uh, I mean, I I. Th- it's funny because like the, the games were so different. He really struggled in that first game. And, you know, mind you, it was his third career NBA game or whatever it was at that point. Um, so we've already seen what a couple months can do for him uh, confidence wise and sort of just rhythmically as, as a rim protector. But uh, I don't know. I mean, like this is, this has been sort of the theme of the season so far is, is what, Chet and Wemby mean for the league and and whether they are ushering in sort of a new, the next wave of stylistic changes that teams take, you know, will more teams try to identify these extremely long, lanky centers? Um, Wait, wait, you think they're hard to identify? (laughs) What? (laughs) You think those guys are hard to identify? Well, (laughs) I'm just saying like, all I'm getting at is like, you know, we we talk about sort of the, the changes in, in the course of the NBA. Michael Moore was just asked about this in Toronto, about the uh, NBA being a copycat league and how, um, you know, certain teams find success one way and other teams try to replicate it. And we saw it with the Spurs for a little while and then we saw it with the Warriors and now maybe 
more teams are getting away from pick and roll and getting into sort of an, uh, an offense built around the elbow or, or around a big who can operate the high post and, and make things happen around them like Jokic does and like Embiid can. Um, and so when you're, I think people like to try to identify like what will the next shift in the NBA's tectonic plates of like tactics be and, uh, the fact that Wembenyama and Chet are rookies at the same time, um, and just their sort of alien appearance, appearances, like physically, is sort of a fascinating flashpoint um, in the NBA. So I, I don't know. I like I. It's a cold take to say that I think Wemby's going to be better than Chet, but I do <laughs> think that. Um, <laughs> wow! Yeah, you're going out on a limb with that. Yeah, I, it doesn't mean that I don't think Chet will be a pretty outstanding player so and I, um, I think he can be i think he can be the second best player on a title team there oh for chet you're saying the second but okay yeah essentially yeah. like shea is going to be the one driving the bus for the entire time that they're together yes i think that's fair i, I think that's entirely fair um yeah you think it you very think well Chet's could be shay i mean He's a massive dude who can shoot and block shots and rebound. Um, okay. I, I they, think there's they, a they world where the, that where Chet passes him by. I'm not saying I'm, it's going to happen. Um, but, that's basically um, saying that, that Chet's going to be a top five player in the league at some point. So You don't think that's possible? No, I, I, I think it's possible. I the, the one thing I worry about with Chet is just like – the the injury factor with yes. a guy of that build it's, it's the same him and Wemby are the same way. Out of my head. yes exactly yeah, the, it, but the, they both have the same concern they the, that body type uh has not had a good run in the nba throughout its history uh generally speaking those body types don't hold up over time but who knows maybe uh we've made some strides as far as uh player development and um, and uh, you know training and all of that. Who knows? I, I I will say this though. I think it's very clear that both of those guys uh, could be yeah among the five best in the NBA at some point during their careers. I, I think that's very possible. Fair enough. Uh, this this you uh, being on the Thunder oh. wagon reminds me of the game I wanted to throw at you, which was if you had to uh, like form your own top eight in the West right now, not at all based on teams records or anything, but just where you think like who you think the best teams will ultimately be. Who would those are we talking about be? this? Are we talking about this year or yes, are we yes, talking this year, this year? Oh, like, okay. Like who will be the best teams? Well, I, I, you know, I, I wavered with the Suns, but I just, I don't see it. I'm sorry. I, I, it's the, the injuries just keep happening. Um, you were back I, in two weeks. Ago. I know, I know. I was very, but like, I, the thing is, is like, they, they're just, they're not very good defensively. Um, they, I don't think they take games as seriously as a, a good team should. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of backing away from them. I, I'm slowly getting pulled into the Timberwolves. I, I, I just, I don't know. It's hard for me to take the Timberwolves seriously. It really is. Um, I do think Oklahoma city is for real though. That, that I am buying them. Um, I'm not the buying They're playing winners well. of nine in a row. The Clippers. Yeah. yeah I no. Uh, uh-uh. I, sorry. <laughs> I, I don't. They're the, it's the, it's the Clippers. Uh, I get it. Kawhi has been healthy this whole time. That's great. I hope that continues. It would be fun to see a healthy Clippers team face the Nuggets in the playoffs. I just, recent history says that that's not likely. Um, So if I'm like saying who's the biggest threats, it's probably some combination of the Thunder, the Lakers, um, and... I don't know who that third team is. Maybe the Timberwolves. Maybe. Wow. Still Tim. Okay. I think I, I, it, I, I'm tired I think at the end of the year, we'll still be 
The Timberwolves like pretty high in the standings. If they might not be the one seed, but they're I think they're going to be top two. Right, but are you? If you're the Nuggets, are you really afraid of them in a playoff series? Yeah, I think I think you respect them. I <laughs> I just I, that offense. I just see that offense bogging down in the playoffs. I, uh, <laughs> Rudy Rudy Gobert offenses don't fare well in the playoffs. Um, Cat, I, I can't get his last playoff performance out of my head. Uh, I, I think it devolves into something with Ant that uh, isn't sustainable over three or four straight series. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if it's sustainable. Like, I, I don't think the Timberwolves are going to win the championship, but I don't know. Like, I I think at the end of the year we're still looking at them. I think the Nuggets are like if you take the step back from the league going into the playoffs, you're like, okay, the Nuggets are the best team in the West. I think the Timberwolves are second. I think the Lakers are third. Thunder fourth. Um, this is regardless of seeding. I think like the Lakers could be the seventh seed um, again, and you would still say that they're one of the three most dangerous right. teams. Which, which, which brings um, me to my point. Like if the Lakers were playing the Tim- Timberwolves in the first round, would you really be confident that the Timberwolves are going to beat the Lakers in that series? Um, that's, that's my two, three matchup right there. So, <laughs> so no, I wouldn't, uh, I guess. Um, that would be a tough beat for the Timberwolves. I can like I don't know how you can even blame them in that situation. But well, they, they've won two playoff series in their entire existence. It's like I said, we'll see. Um, I think they win a playoff series this year. All right, so um, we're we're gonna you, you do okay, good. Um, we're gonna take a quick break here, and then we're gonna come back. Um, and because we're you know total schmucks, we'll actually have a Christmas themed. Uh, uh, debate uh, over the Nuggets and the NBA in general. Who's naughty? Who's nice? Um, and then after that, we have a couple emails. Uh, did not break uh, the previous record of three set by the last podcast, but we do have two and a review. So we'll get all that to all that after this. Hey there, everyone. Just wanted to let you know for the Nugget fan in your life, or maybe for yourself. We've got a book on the championship season that was for the Denver Nuggets. They're hanging a banner. We're selling books. The book is gold standard. How the Denver Nuggets won their first NBA championship. All sorts of great stories and photos. It is the gift that keeps on giving. If you got a Nuggets fan in your life, Hanukkah, Christmas, Valentine's Day, Boxing Day, it fits every occasion. Find it at local bookstores near you or online at denverpost.com. And we are back. Thanks to the wonders of technology. Bennett Durando in New York, me, your host, Matt Schubert in Denver proper. And uh, we are talking nuggets. We've got a special Christmas themed segment here. Uh, sadly, no AA Ron Ontiveros to to participate in it with us. I know that the uh, the the listeners have been begging for more AA Ron content. Uh, you're just going to have to wait. Uh, hopefully, that comes under the Christmas tree here in the next couple of days. Um, so, not your nice list here, Bennett. And I'm going to start off with my my first naughty here. And that is the Nuggets free throw shooting. Oh boy, is that bad? I mean, yesterday they have, what, they it, have to attempt free throws for for it to be naughty. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's true, but I mean that can't all be the refs, right? No, it's not. It's not. I every, I know everyone loves to say, "Oh, look at it. it took until late in the third quarter." for them to attempt a free throw in Toronto. And that's totally the ref's fault while Embiid was busy scoring 22 points or whatever on free throw. Like, it's not just all the refs, like, you know, but like I, I, whenever we can have like nuanced discussions about this, which I thought we did on, on the last podcast, actually, uh, that would be great. I, I don't think we're capable of it as a society. Do you, do you think it's just style of play? that has, That's a has huge, been- that's a huge part of it. Yeah. I mean, they, they, 
operate with so much ball movement and so much cutting and like they're all about finding the open look like they are not playing to draw shooting fouls that is not quite so much their offense like sometimes like when it's just a straight Jokic post up okay or when it's Aaron Gordon sort of committing to um putting his back into someone and putting his shoulder into someone like that's a different scenario but that's not what their offense is 100 percent of the time um and so a lot of what it is is just finding looks that are ultimately better looks than a contested situation where you're taking a chance on trying to get a foul called. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's mostly right. Of course, that doesn't address the fact that they haven't been shooting free throws well pretty much all season. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That's bad. That is naughty. Definitely. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Aaron Gordon in particular, obviously has been one of the big culprits, Uh, but I think Jokic's numbers are down too. And it's just, Um, you know, they get to the playoffs, that's going to have to be fixed. Uh, I agree. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's bizarre that everyone's percentages have sort of dropped in coinciding fashion. Um, you know, the fact that at least at one point very recently, pretty much every player on the roster was, uh, at least a few percentage points below their career average. Um, so Fatigue, maybe. Just a, uh, yeah, maybe. But you know, free throws are free throws. Like that, that shouldn't be that much of a fatigue thing. Yeah, like that. that, That's just like that's like pure like robotic. Like, just do the exact same thing. I I don't know. It's it's bizarre. It's kind of hard to explain. I, I don't. It's there's not really like a thing that you can identifies like this is why this is happening i feel like it's sort of just one of those things all right next on the list nice the nuggets young bench core we already mm-hmm. talked about peyton and we we talked uh some about christian brown but zeke Naji has been pretty decent of late um you have to like what you're seeing from that group I think so far this season, if you were drawing up one of the things that was going to be really important, obviously it was the development of the young guys on the bench. And right now, that looks pretty good. I'll add one thing to, uh, you know, to Brown and and Watson sort of rightfully being the epicenter of that. Um, Michael Malone pointed out the other night something that I've sort of noticed, which is the Nuggets just keep calling – uh, ATO after timeout plays for Julian Strother. It is really fascinating. Um, and and so I, I asked him about it in Toronto because Malone basically said, like, I think we've called more ATOs for Strother than for anyone else on our team. Um, and he basically was like, I mean, it's just his ability. Like, and, and I think the coaching staff has a recognition that when Strother makes one three, um, you suddenly have a window that has opened um, and you need to capitalize on what sort of could become a heat check moment with him. Um, This is what happened in Atlanta. They're down double digits in that second quarter during the second unit minutes. And they run multiple plays out of timeouts for Strother. He scores both times. It's sort of what ignites him on um, what ends up being a season high 22 for him, 19 in the first half. So uh, just fascinating that, Michael Malone, whose reputation is so veteran centric and and sort of reluctant to uh, lean heavily on rookies, the fact that that he and this coaching staff um, are leaning into a lot of Strother design plays like that, it's really fascinating. So young bench core, absolutely a nice right now. One more nice that is piggybacked on top of it, Cal Booth, Calvin. Mm-hmm. Drafting wizard. Yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, like, what can you say? I. It's it's pretty amazing. Picks in the twenties and thirties that are uh, that are potentially panning out. I. It. You know. It's. There's always the balance of like, can you say that someone has panned out already at a certain point? Um, the answer is probably no. Um, well, I think you can say Christian Brown has because he was he contributed yeah, to a, a championship point. run. Yeah, yeah. No, that's and that's 
a, a lot to ask for uh, a guy picked in the 20s as a rookie to, to be one of the rotation guys in the playoffs. That is absolutely a lot to ask. Um, and, it, and it seems, you know, like we've talked about, it seems reasonable to believe that Peyton Watson is um, a guy drafted at 30 who could be a championship rotation player this season. So, um, yeah. And, and Strother I, seems like at this point he's started to cement himself as a, as a guy that they're going to stick with. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, he is, he is worth uh, developing in, in the next, you know, several months for sure. But I really, over the next couple of years, I'm curious to see when it gets to, you know, bench shortening time around the playoffs, it, how much they want to use him or if they really go lean um, with their rotations and, and keep it to seven or eight guys, you know, they're, there just isn't room for Strother in that situation because I think everyone can agree that Reggie Jackson, Christian Brown, and Peyton Watson are the first three guys off the bench. So um, let, let me throw out something possibly blasphemous here. Um, okay. Is there a world where two to three years from now, Strother is the MPJ replacement? Um, not impossible at all. Um, I mean, like there's definitely that mold of like, Oh, here's that next just absolutely lethal shooter um, who you hope can space the floor and be especially good as a spot up player. Uh, You know, I, and you know, you hope that you can get good defense from time to time out of him. MPJ has had flashes, but it obviously it's been extremely inconsistent. So um, no, yeah, it's not unreasonable to, think that especially with the the contract that Porter is on and and the potential salary cap ramifications over the next couple of years if the Nuggets do win more than one championship um not unfair at all all right next naughty mm-hmm. Nikola Jokic and the refs yeah who's naughtier I feel like the refs are naughtier in this instance. As we talked about the last time we, we chatted, uh, if you're dropping an MF on somebody, not great, not fantastic, also probably not worth getting thrown out immediately from an NBA game. Yeah, I uh, I agree. I, it, I mean, the Chicago one was terrible. Um I, I think Jokic is a little naughty also because sure there, there have been other games where he's just – he's gotten on the ref, the the officiating in, in sort of his almost like flamboyant, like very expressive way of, uh, of arguing a call over something that maybe isn't that big of a deal early in a game. And it just makes you think, oh boy, Jokic is playing with fire again. Like where could this lead – by the end of the second quarter, that type of situation. Um, so he's not entirely unnaughty, but the refs are definitely naughtier. Um, yeah, I think I'm, he hasn't he hasn't ratcheted it up to like Luca levels. You know that I, that's to me is you know he's still um for like an NBA superstar. If that's the, yeah, the, yeah, if, I, I if that's what we're putting the level at, um, he's one of the better, more behaved players. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, I've got I've got a general nice is just the Nuggets offense. The most impressive thing about them right now, uh, they are second in the league in assists as at the time of our recording, and third in the league in fewest turnovers. Um, that's that's fantastic. That's a they are playing extremely like efficient, clean basketball. Um, it's sort of is you know, exactly the vision that you want to have. Like as, as much as there have been sort of some weird slumps early in this season, I think it's to be expected with, with the schedule and with, you know, maybe a tiny bit of championship hangover. Like this is still just a very good basketball team that plays a very beautiful brand of basketball. And, well, and on top of that, the, a nice that you could add to that, Reggie Jackson has been a big part of that, you know, mm-hmm. assist to turnover ratio. Um, uh, upside, and I don't think we all saw that coming two months ago. I, no, I certainly didn't. I know. Yeah, I mean that's another addition to the nice list is the uh, Reggie Jackson, DeAndre Jordan pick and roll. 
<laughs> that's right. <laughs> That, I mean, that's like, that's literally part of what went into the decision um, to sort of give Jordan some more run in recent games is because they love the chemistry that those two have together at the offensive end. And I think Michael Malone sort of found that those two veterans and especially the way that they sort of run the offense sort of complements the youth of the rest of that second unit pretty nicely. Um, so Reggie Jackson is, is a nice list on his own, but, but that pick and roll um, – with DeAndre Jordan, that's pretty smooth. Um, I would I would say uh, a naughty list uh, addition right now is every part of Jamal Murray's legs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So I, I, there's not much more to say about that. Uh, but but yeah, the, Jamal Murray would like his legs to behave a little bit better in the new year. Yeah, certainly minutes restriction uh, midseason, not something uh, that uh, that you want out of you no. want one of your best players, but uh, that's where they're at, and I don't blame them. I don't, I don't blame Jamal either. They, they've got to find a way to ease him back into where he's comfortable again. I agree. Um, a uh, Another nice is going to be Caldwell Pope's defense. Um, oh, I had that written down. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's like legitimately in, in some uh, potential all defense conversations right now. I think uh, we'll see, I, like it's early in the season still. There's a lot of basketball to be played. Um, but his, uh, his numbers, like the, the inefficiency of his matchups, um, the, he's still near the top of the league in steals. Like he is, he's right there with a lot of, um, the guards who we sort of naturally associate with elite defense, like Drew Holiday, um, you know, wings like OG Ananobi, those kinds of players. I Lee think Dort. this is sort of his year to get it to. Um, yeah. If, if it doesn't happen, like, of course, they could win another title this year and he gets even more shine. And the next year, maybe it's just like, it doesn't even matter what he does. We're putting him on there. Um, but this seems like, one of the prime years that he ought to be in that conversation ought to make it. Yeah, no, uh, I agree. This is the, the team's been uh, campaigning for it. They're still, whenever he gets the DPOG chain, they're still chanting first team every time. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Nuggets are not losing sight of the narrative. Can I give a naughty to the DPOG chain? I'm, I'm just not a fan. Okay, uh, I'll give a naughty to when the DPOG chain goes to two different players on the same night. Oh, that's yeah, that's absolutely terrible. Like, What's what the is point? the point of like, the chain? Why, why do you even have the chain? That's like 20% of your roster. <laughs> like, <laughs> why are we doing this at that point? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay with it going to one guy, but uh, but fair enough. Yeah, I, I, your, your point is taken. All right. Any other naughties or nices you want to throw out there before we get to the emails? Yeah, schedules on on the naughty list for sure. Um, it's going to get real nice, though. Uh, it's going to get real nice. Uh, I wrote about this last weekend. The dramatic uh, discrepancy in back to backs, uh, as well as home road balance between the Nuggets and the Timberwolves. Uh, so if if you want to make your Timberwolves hate case, part of it can. Um, you know, you can you can cite the schedule for part of that. The fact that through January fifth, the Nuggets have uh, how many? What I, I think it comes out to nine back to backs, and uh, the Timberwolves have two, and then they the Timberwolves end up having eleven in the rest of the season from there. So uh, logic would have it that things are going to balance out for Minnesota a little bit. Um, with their schedule while the Nuggets uh, gets a little bit more relaxing in the second half of the season. You know, I, I don't know if this is just part of how Nuggets games get scheduled on a year-to-year basis, but I can tell you this. They did have a road-heavy start to last season as well, and it led to them being, I would say, a little inconsistent to begin the season, and then they just went on a surge in January, February, and yeah. that put them at the top of the Western Conference. Certainly could happen again this time. Yeah, yeah. One last addition to the nice list, not a Nuggets one, um, but but I think it's notable because it is a, a recent switch from the naughty to the nice list is John Morant. 
Um, oh yeah. Although I got to tell you, uh, no regrets. Really? Not one job. <laughs> Not a single regret. He says as the Grizzlies are in the cellar of the Western Conference. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I, I kind of felt like I, I saw a lot of people said, he, oh, he said all the right things. And I thought, well, no, he didn't. Uh, he basically said, like, I didn't do anything wrong. Um, no regrets. Like, you should regret past actions that <laughs> led to you being uh, disciplined by the NBA in a way that hasn't been seen since the palace brawl. Yeah. yeah. All right. Maybe that quote might belong on the naughty list still, but <laughs> he is, he is literally just been freed from the naughty list though, in, in the most literal terms that we can um, assign to this. And, and he looked really nice in that first game. Uh, yeah, he did. 30, 34 points, 24 shots, eight assists, two steals, the buzzer beater, obviously in new Orleans. Um, you think they make the playoffs? No, but uh, definitely going to be too little, too late. I think twenty-five games is too much. But um, but I'm happy for Job being back. Hopefully he's okay. Okay. All right. Let's move on to emails. Uh, we got to get out of here. Uh, Bennett's got himself a, a date night uh, out in Manhattan. So. Um... <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, our old friend uh, Michael Handy. Uh, He's now a habitual emailer to the show. Um, uh, I believe seventy-two years old. Are we? We're, we're going with seventy-two, right? I don't know. You're the the email bookkeeper, not me. <laughs> uh, there's part of this uh, that that might be, uh, let's just say, inappropriate. So we're going to stay away from that part of the email, um, but we will read uh, relevant parts here. Uh, Tis I. He whom do not want to be around when the refried beans begin to digest. Oh, my gosh. That's definitely a 72-year-old man's job. <laughs> That's the appropriate part of the email. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to jump ahead here. Okay. About the show. You know, I don't get it. If a player in today's NBA were averaging 50 points and 25 rebounds a game, you guys, the media, would be losing your freaking minds. But because Wilt did it before there was color TV or cable or ESPN, you act like it never happened. Kareem over Wilt? Please. I choose Wilt first, and he would outscore, out-rebound, out-block, and out-assist Kareem or any other center you could name. Well, Jokic would have more assists, but even he, so far, has not led the entire league in assists. In the vaunted sky brick, Wilt used to swat it. Saw him do it live and in person. If you don't believe it, you can go to YouTube and see for yourself. It may have been the most unguardable shot ever, except for against Wilt. I would choose Joker second because of all the centers I have ever seen play. He is the one that does the best job of making everyone around him better. If he and Wilt would have played together, Wilt would have averaged a hundred. Okay. Maybe not, but pretty darn close. Now a question about the nuggets or he says lay nuggets, lay nuggets. Um, what do you guys think of the bench at this point of the season versus last year's bench? The record is the same, 17 and 10 as of today. So this is a couple of days back. But I think the bench is reasonably better. In the OKC 12 16 game, the bench plus minus was higher than the starters. And I can't remember the last time that happened. Christian has improved his free throws and three point percentage and does a, have a noticeably better handle than last year. Peyton has shown flashes of brilliance more consistently. Julian has shown us what he can do when he gets hot, and all three can usually play decent defense. I'm very optimistic. The last time the rest of the league wanted to see the Nuggets with, was with – the last. Oh, I'm sorry, the last thing the rest of the league wanted to see was the Nuggets with a good bench. And that's all, folks. Keep on smoking that superb Colorado herb, my brother, and don't be a Bogart. Share a toker two or three with Bennett and Aaron. I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Oh, I'm 74 since you forgot. <laughs> well, I, uh, we, we covered the bench stuff. I, yeah, I do think they're better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who would have thought we'd be saying that after the Bruce Brown departure? But yeah, I think no, I agree. Totally. Totally agree. Fantastic. I, I think it's outrageous that he doesn't. 
him as one of his top two centers of all time, but uh, I, <laughs> clearly he's not going to be convinced. No, no, he's he's all he's all aboard on Wilt, and I get it. Wilt, he put up fantastic numbers. There's there's no arguing that. Um, all right, next one. This is our second one. Uh, this is from Mark and Elisa or Elisa Leontovich. They they uh, I don't know if I'm saying this right, and, and the emailer gets to this. Um, at some point, he can actually put in the phonetic pronunciation mark. If you could do that on your next email, that'd be much appreciated. Gentlemen, thank you for answering somewhat my question on your last podcast. This time, I've got two questions. Mr. Shubbert, was, phon- was phonics around when you, were, when you went to school? You completely butchered my last name and my wife's first name. <laughs> Funny you should mention that. I actually had to go to a special phonics class in second grade. I, I was behind. Um, wow. Second. Yeah, you really yeah, yes, cut yes. into some deep old wounds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, second. Do you consider OKC a serious threat to the Nuggets' chances of a repeat? They seem to have the type of team that gives Denver some trouble. They've got length. A deadly assassin. They drive and kick, and they've got a small, a smart young coach, Mark uh, Dagenault. Let's hear your. Let's see, hear you pronounce that one. Did I say that right? Did I <laughs> D- Dagenault? I, I, I'm not. How, how do you pronounce that one? Uh, I have my idea of what it is, and it's not that. But I, I'm not going <laughs> to say it out of fear of embarrassing myself. <laughs> You've Most, already gotten it wrong, I think. Yes, so. I'm pretty sure I got it wrong already. Most experts think that they're a year or two away. Anyway, I enjoy your show, The Witty Repartee, and kudos to you guys for an entertaining and educational podcast. Keep it going. Best, Mark. Uh, we covered OKC. Um, we're, I, I mean, we're, we're ahead of the curve here. We, uh, yeah. we, we knew what to cover before the questions came flying. Pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, and, yeah, I, I, as we said, they're a threat. There's no doubt. I think that's – you You seem to think five games, I think six. You know, it could go either way there. Um, yeah. It, more so, I mean, like to Miller's point, they're the biggest threat in the West over the next five years for sure. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so we've got one review. We're actually going to wait to read that for our next podcast, and we need more. Five yeah. stars – Lie with your stars, tell the truth with your review, go to iTunes, rate Nuggets, Inc. Bennett, thank you so much for joining me from what I'm only assuming is a luxury hotel in the business district of Manhattan. Uh, Enjoy your time out there. Hope date night goes well. Uh, We'll be back here again, and Merry Christmas to all of you. That's what they call it when Missouri journalism grads go have a beer together. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Happy holidays. Looks like we have another dragon, Master Ace, spitting the burning passion. It's about to be a catastrophe. He thought I was the only survivor, but at last we meet. Like the food vegans don't eat I know you can see the infernal blaze We would probably burn the stage And leave it with third degrees And inside of us is an internal blaze Blazing eternally like a furnace But it's so hot it's burning The furnace is framed Your family and furniture isn't safe Better evacuate Cause the skill we can calibrate Reduces the chances of your survival If you ever try to retaliate So dance to this recital So you can slowly gravitate towards us Who needs a chorus When you're hotter than Earth's core is No strings attached We're no puppets Yo, we're cordless I fly even when I'm hurt, yo, that's soaring Your skill isn't apparent, it's an orphan We proceed to spit the verse That takes your spirit and lifts it high into the earth's atmospheres Don't come, atmosphere of influence, you squares I take a spear and put it through, yeah, I raise the stakes Ha, medium rare, you're the least of the media spheres Why he's the reason the media's scared Please be prepared to be impaired Go see repairs, defeating people in pairs Jordans, I thought I needed pairs To be compared to the people in pairs <laughs> This is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new values, and a new experience.
Gather round hip hoppers as if you're still living. Still got love for the game, I'm still giving and still driven. Like Diddy in the Maybach. I've been repping for the city since way back. All y'all rappers better stay back. Cause you still can't find me, I'm a needle in a haystack. A rare breeze sitting high up in the chariot. While y'all dudes getting high up in the Marriott. Well, consider this your wake up call. If you're married to the game, it's the breakup call. And you ain't wearing a crown if you're not tearing it down. You clowns get found right there in the ground. Six feet, dirt nap, that's because your shit's weak. I'm a giant, you a pip sweet. Welcome to my kingdom, yup. Throne as an occupant. Read my name at the bottom of the document. Check the scroll. Giving good times like Esther Rowe. Peace to keep the E, God bless the soul. Trying to get more checks to hold. On some slick brick, Mr. T shit, big chest of gold. And the flow still extra cold. Like the North Pole, cocaine snow, another lost soul. Bow down, it's the Grand Royal, yup. 20 plus years in the game, still the fans loyal. <laughs> 